He says, across different blog posts and podcasts, you've shared a wealth of knowledge about nutrition and nutrient timing in relation to training. I'm wondering if you could put it all together into a perfect day of, for eating performance. Now I know that we're not robots, et cetera, but it would be nice to have a guide of what to aim for. For example, when relative to my workout or when relative to my workout, should I consume antioxidants? If I'm an evening workouter, should I have a protein rich breakfast and transition to more carb focused foods in the afternoon? Where do things like beet juice, tart cherry juice and collagen come into the mix? Thank you. The answer for tart cherry juice is all the time. Um, <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> cause it's delicious, uh, but uh, going uh, away from that and into this, we thought this is a great opportunity to kind of run through, uh, run through once again, the ideal day of nutrition, but also point out some flexibility within that, right? Amber, cause it's not, if only we were robots and we could eat the same every day. <laughs> right. Right. There's no secret formula. Let's just start there. And again, to Jonathan's point, being flexible is really key. So you want to apply some pretty general principles. So I'm going to start by covering some basic principles that I think are generally applicable, and then go into a few examples of how you would actually apply those principles into an actual day where you're training. Um, so these would be normal training days. We're not going to look at like a race day situation. And the perspective that I'm coming at this from is my belief, and this is me, um, is that really you want to get the most out of your training. So to, to get the most out of your training, you want to fuel your training and give your body what it needs to accomplish the highest quality work. So the better quality work you can do in a training session, the better the training stress is going to be, the better your adaptations will be. And that's really what we're, that's really what we're after, right? Is you want to stress the system appropriately to get the adaptations that you want. And the, the higher the quality of stress, uh, the higher the quality of those adaptations will be. And not only that, but the nutrition, you know, post-workout is going to have something to do with how well you're adapting. So I really like the idea of fueling each workout so that you can get the most out of each workout. So it's really about getting the highest quality performance out of yourself on the day. So I'm really going to focus on fueling strategy. I don't want to get too far into the weeds on supplements in particular. I will say probably for tart jerry juice, maybe in the evening, like before bed might be a good time for that. But um, just focusing mostly on the performance, we'll go through some stuff. Yeah, Jonathan. On the tart cherry juice thing, it's like uh, Chad and I have talked before about our sweet tooth killers, so to speak, <laughs> like uh, the little things that we'll do in the evenings when you know we're trying to be conscious of, of, of what we're putting into our bodies and, and fueling our training, but then not being excessive. <laughs> and, and one of the things that I really like to do with that was sweet tooth killer, so to speak, in the evenings, if you really just feel like that ice cream or dessert is a little bit of tart cherry juice. Um, I've mentioned this before, mix it in with some sparkling water or something like that and a dash of lime. And it's really, it's something that's just sweet enough to kind of satisfy that, but it's really not a lot of sugar when you're just using a small amount of it. Cause it, a little bit of tart cherry juice goes a long way. Um, so it's I a great way. I can't remember the exact details, but there's it's tied to melatonin release too. So doing it in the evening can actually benefit the, the release of melatonin and therefore sleep, a little bit yeah. of sleep benefit. Yeah. yeah. So looking at this from a performance perspective, um, and yes, we are going to talk about carbohydrate. Shocking. Um, but the reason <laughs> for that, and you guys have heard us say this many, many times before, but the reason is it works and it is really the key to getting the most out of a workout and really getting the highest quality work in a session. So with that, let's look at some principles. The first and overarching principle with all of this is your number one goal is to nourish yourself and nourishing has a lot to do with nutrients, fuel, but it's also energetic. It's also mood. And this is about mind and body, right? It's not just a physical thing. Um, and to that point, I think it's important to remember that your body is always trying to help. So fueling yourself well is about helping your body help you. Um, second point is don't diet on the bike. It might seem tempting because it's easy to, you know, you're, you're not, you don't have food accessible to you if you don't put stuff in your pockets, but this is not the time to cut calories. This is the time to really fuel the work that you're doing. So fuel your effort with what you eat before, during, and immediately after your ride. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, and Jonathan has a quick comment here on that one. Yeah. Like I was just going to say, like, I was thinking about this uh, over last weekend and we're so proud of starving ourselves all the time and doing okay. some sort of performance thing. And we have this weird obsession no. with doing that. I don't know why. And when I say we, I mean, it seems like humans in general, <laughs> they're like, he did that with no food and we're all very impressed, but 
we should be proud of our fueling, like be proud of the deal. Like we're all proud of the fact that we really hit our marks on our intervals. We should be really proud of the fact that we hit our marks with our nutrition. It should be another mm -hmm. thing that, that goes along with that. And, and it's not easy. Chad's been riding for years and it's still something that you struggle with Chad. Like it's mm -hmm. nothing that you're going to be perfect at once you start at, but if you try it and you institute some sort of intentional framework for nutrition into your training, be proud when you make steps toward making it better. Uh, that, that should be another strong source of pride for you as an athlete, because it leads toward health and better performance. The thing that I will, you know, you will get that message that says, well, I did an 80 mile ride in just water. I'm like, mm -hmm. that's if that is the outcome that you're shooting for, that's one thing. But in this podcast, the outcome is performance. How can we get faster with Trina Road? And those are two different things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if you just listen to Amber more, I'm not even gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is, this is a good point. Nutrition is a really good process goal. You know, learning how to fuel mm -hmm. yourself better, fuel yourself well is a really good process goal because it's something that is within your control and that you can really work on intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, so the third principle I want to talk about is that um, that fueling it does need to be mostly carbohydrate. And I'll get into that a little bit more, but before enduring is almost exclusively carbohydrate. That's what your body's going to be using for fuel. And then after for immediately after in that golden window is where you really want to get some carbohydrate and protein. I'll get into the numbers on that. Um, one of the principles I use as a rule of thumb, and again, this is not something you have to do right away, but it's a good process goal is I kind of add up the calories from carbohydrate before and during the ride. And I aim for those to equal about what I'm going to burn on the ride. And then I'll have a recovery shake separate from that. So I don't use the recovery shake necessarily in uh, trying to cover what I'm burning. It's the before and during that should cover what you're burning. And then the recovery shake is an extra on top of that. Um, and then the recovery shake, I like to go for that four to one carbohydrate to protein ratio. And that's that ratio is measured in grams. And then each carb gram of carbohydrate is, uh, four kilocalories and, uh, versus protein, I think is, I don't, don't quote me on that. <laughs> I have the math later on <laughs> it's a little bit early. I need a little more caffeine. Um, then the other one is you want to hydrate. So you want to be hydrating off the bike and on the bike. And when you're on the bike, you want to make sure that you're also replacing electrolytes in addition to taking on water. And then the other meals throughout the day, this is where you really want to emphasize nutrient density, but not at the cost of enjoyment. So part of fueling and nourishing yourself is enjoying your meals, enjoying the food that you're taking in. Um, and I think that it's important that instead of applying labels of good or bad, I think it's good to think of food in terms of options. And by the way, how awesome is it that we have options that we can choose mm. from and that each option of fueling and nourishment that we have confers certain benefits. And some options confer a lot of benefit, like nutrients, satiety, enjoyment, comfort, connection, great taste, sustained energy, elevated mood. That's awesome. And then some things maybe don't confer as much benefit. Maybe it tastes good and there's a brief energy bump and brief enjoyment. It's not bad. <laughs> it's just not as the, the benefits aren't as numerous as with other foods. So I think it's really important to think about foods in terms of what benefits are going to confer and how different foods make you feel because we're all individual and some foods are going to be really, really, they're just going to work with our body and they're, you know, you're going to get tons of energy and good mood elevation and others not so much. Yeah. John like Popeyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> even like a good way of doing this too, is even if you think like, uh, so a good example of this. If I have scratch recovery mix and it has lactase added into it, so uh, I have lactose, I have, I'm lactose intolerant, right? Uh, and scratch has lactase added in. I try that. It just messes with my stomach every time. Even with that, even if I take lactase as well, like lactate pills, you know, and I take that in. But if I have cliff nutrition and I bring my own lactate, it's so much better. So there's a temptation too to sometimes just like say, well, recovery drinks is just simply don't work for me. 
and kind of throw them out. But maybe it's just trying a different uh, version of the same thing, so to speak. It's one scratch chocolate, one is cliff chocolate, and the cliff chocolate just happens to work better on my stomach. So to your point, Amber, a lot of the time you'll say, well, this just doesn't work out for me. Well, maybe try a different version of the same thing. And that can even go with like produce, right? Like if you're getting kale from a specific store, maybe try it from a different store. It's not as bad as you think. Uh, plenty of different options like that. I have a pro tip to make your own recovery drink a lot cheaper. Sorry to interject in here, Amber, but oh, go uh, for it. Listen. So <clears throat> to John, I am also lactose intolerant. Um, I think a good protein source, and this has been backed up with like not heavy metals and a, a, like the amount of protein that it says is in it is the on nutrition, uh, way. And they have like the gold way, but you just get the regular way. Uh, very cheap. You get a whole bunch of it. It tastes okay. And then you can buy maltodextrin or and fructose on uh just online like on amazon and it is super duper duper cheap like you'll be 25 pound bag for like 20 dollars or something and then mm -hmm. you can just measure out whatever ratios you want in a four to one uh carb to protein mix and then in your fructose to uh maltodextrin do a two to one inside of there so you gotta do a teeny bit of math but if you make that and you get the chocolate flavor then you can add some electrolytes to it um depending on how much you want which is basically just you just add table salt uh you're, you're like there in a really cheap recovery drink that does not mess with your stomach. Uh, yeah. I'm going to make ritual chocolate recovery drink, ritual <laughs> chocolate. It's this like chocolate that Chad and I obsess over and it's incredibly good. Also mm. made by a cyclist, uh, Robbie and, and Anna, they're big cyclists and on the company, but I'm going to make ritual chocolate recovery now, Chad. Is it's it powdered? Do they have powdered chocolate? Yeah. So you can get drinking chocolate drinking and it's chocolate. powdered. Yeah. Mm. And oh my goodness. Great. I'm, I want to make it right now. That sounds so just what <laughs> Amber said about nourishing yourself. Like I know that ritual chocolate, every time John eats it, he loves it. And I know this cause he tells everyone about it like <laughs> on Instagram. It's like his CrossFit. He loves yeah. ritual chocolate more than anything on earth. And it is really good. Uh, yeah. But I see yeah. more posts about ritual chocolate than his son. It's just saying. <laughs> so what you can do, like that, that's the thing though. He, he's, he's adding something just to make it like look so forward to it. Have that yeah. like yeah. his brain just say yes. And he doesn't go, oh, I'm, and actually this chocolate's probably good for you too, right? The antioxidant content. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. It, it's the eating dark. It's very dark chocolate too, I'm guessing, right? Like a high yeah, cacao. Yeah, Always. Yeah. 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 So anyways. Lots of benefits. Yeah. Of benefit. Like in, you mentioned this plenty of time. Like you mentioned it there with just like enjoying your meals and everything else. And we're like, if you can find food that is nutritious for you and then you actually enjoy it, which it, that takes constant experimentation. It's not like you mm -hmm. experiment for a period and find it, then you hold on to that food forever, you know, but when you can find that, man, it just makes the whole process so much easier and life in general better. Um, totally. It turns eating because I, I've fallen victim to this plenty of times as an athlete where eating becomes kind of a necessity and a bit of a drag. You just feel like, oh, I got to get food in and I, you know, it's like, it becomes a, a monotonous process and, and, but it's so much of our lives and you think about it, what we're putting into us and, and how often we do it. So it is so much better to do it with some enjoyment. Yeah. And, like and really you can experiment tip. with, you know, maybe broccoli a certain way. Steamed broccoli is just not your thing. I found that roasting broccoli with salt and olive oil, to me, it's so good. It tastes like candy. Like my husband and I joke, that's what we, that's our shorthand for that term is we roast <laughs> broccoli and cauliflower together. And we call it candy because it's so delicious for, to us. And mm -hmm. I guarantee that things that you might think are just kind of gross because, oh, it's, it's too good for you. And you know, who can actually like the flavor of kale? There's a million ways of preparing food. And you might find a way that something that really elevates your energy makes you feel really good. If you find a new way of preparing it, that is actually more palatable and something that you really, really enjoy it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. So, you know, experimenting with how you're preparing your foods is another, is another good way to, to, to approach this. Um, and I just, you know, tacking on a little bit to that good versus bad foods, uh, guilt never needs to be a part of this equation. It really, really doesn't. And I know a lot of people are attached to this idea that your guilt is what keeps you in line, so mm -hmm. to speak, air quotes. Um, and that makes sense. I mean, it's totally understandable that a lot of us would feel like that because, chances are really good that at some point at a young age, you learn this lesson because somebody in a position of authority used guilt to make you feel terrible for stepping out of line for some reason. And so we learn that at a really young age as a tool for keeping us on track. And it's not necessary. It really isn't. 
when you start to become aware of how food affects you and how you're going to feel an hour after you've eaten, two hours after you've eaten, how much you're enjoying the food, how it's affecting your, your mood and your energy levels, all of those things, when you start to really focus in on that, yeah, from time to time, you're probably going to eat something that doesn't confer a lot of benefit and that maybe an hour later is going to leave you feeling pretty blah. But those are not the foods that you're going to gravitate to on a consistent basis. You'll find yourself gravitating more to the foods that are going to make you feel good in the bigger picture. So um, I really strongly suggest that you know you kind of re-examine that idea that guilt is a necessary tool for you. I I strongly suspect it's not. Um, mm. And I just kind of wanted to pose a question to the group here. Like when you guys eat well for nourishment, do you find that you gravitate towards foods that confer more benefit for you? Oh, totally. hundred yeah. percent. For me too, yeah. it's the quantity where I will feel guilty for eating too much quantity. And then because I'm like, Ooh, I should like lose a couple. I want the scale to go down. And then every single time, every single time, like within, 10 days, my training falls off like a cliff, right? <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, I, if I do lose some weight, my FTP goes down, my power weight stays the same. It's, it's, it's this nasty like cycle that I have. And then you, if my FTP goes up, it's always because I'm eating lots of high quality food and a lot of it too, because it's, you know, we're burning a lot. Uh, and yeah, that's all I have to say about that. I'm really bad at segues today. Yeah, Chad, segue. <laughs> my, my, so my junior high school teacher framed it for me way back when he told us that guilt doesn't keep you from doing anything. It only keeps you from enjoying it. So it's, it's really oh, a useless so emotion. So, so there's just not a lot of point in denying yourself something you're going to do anyway if all you're really doing is depriving yourself of the enjoyment that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. And I've carried that with me. It was one of those lessons that stuck. It was just this pithy little comment that he sprinkled in during a lecture, probably didn't think twice about it. And it's, it's stuck with me since then. That's mm. awesome. It's so yeah. true. It's so true. And we're really, we're really good at amnesia with guilt, right? <laughs> in the sense that like, if one thing caused us guilt and we feel like, oh man, I'm never going to do that again. We're certain to do that again. Like, <laughs> you know, like we just go back and do it. So that is like a really useless thing that the big thing that I find too, is with, if I'm eating for more nourishment, everything else becomes easier. So like I view my, my, my life, so to speak, or my performance in life as all the different stress adds up to a certain point. And, and if I have life stress, that's adding up there, it means that I have to have less training stress, but if my life stress goes down, then I can add more training stress. And really the end goal is to be a healthy individual. The end goal isn't to just have a hundred percent training stress and just forget about everything else in life. But I've noticed that when I'm eating for nourishment, my life stress goes down. Because usually what it means is that I spend more time with my family preparing food in the kitchen. It usually means that I spend more time thinking about these things and planning them out and then doing them in such a way where it's more organized. It, it usually means that my life it has a cascading effect through it where my life is more organized and there is less stress. So then that allows me to be able to get more out of my training. I don't necessarily add on more training stress in those moments, but the training stress that I'm dosing my body with, it seems like I absorb more of it and mm -hmm. I become faster from it. So it, it's just, a, and I feel better overall. It's, 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 a, it's a hard choice many times because it isn't our first inclination because our first inclination is just to grab whatever is close and then whatever satisfies at the mouth and then we forget about anything after that. But boy, it pays off. And for mm -hmm. us athletes that have high goals, it really you know pushes us where we need to be. But you know, Nate, you mentioned quantity and that's another thing I think that moderation is key and this is something where a lot of us too will find something that works. We mentioned this a few podcasts ago and we latch onto it and we just hold on to that thing and we'll just stick with that hundred percent. But Nate, when you're talking about eating a lot and doing that sort of stuff, it's a lot of variety. It's not just eating, you know, a bunch of one specific thing, right? Amber, like moderation has its place within this. Yeah. I think variety is really key. And I think, you know, going back to this idea of guilt and, and, exactly what Chad said. It only makes it so you don't enjoy the thing that you're going to do. Um, <laughs> we, we all have favorite treats like your ritual chocolate. And, and mm -hmm. I think those things, they confer a wonderful benefit of immediate gratification. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You guys, um, I, we call these things treats for a reason. They, 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 they boost mood. They bring comfort. There's sometimes a ritual connected mm -hmm. to them. That's important. And if you're enjoying those things from time to time, 
it's the spice of life. You know, those are not necessarily things that we call them treats for a reason. Like they don't have to be things that you just never, ever do. You don't have to set up rigid rules. It's about applying general principles with some flexibility. And I think that again, if you start really paying attention to like, okay, that was awesome immediate gratification, but 30 minutes later, I really didn't feel that great. You know, that's not going to be the thing that you're going to reach for to eat for every meal. It's just, it's just bringing a level of awareness to how what you're taking in is, is really affecting you. Nate, it looked like you had something you wanted to jump in and say. I was going to say an inappropriate joke and I don't know if I should (laughs) say it or not. (laughs) Let's move it right along, Amber. Let's move this thing along. (laughs) Next week then. (laughs) We'll save that for beers with Chad. Yeah. Beers with Nate. Beers with Nate. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Ask me that next beers with Nate thing. (laughs) So my last principle that I want to say is just work your way up to better fueling. And we just, we touched on this earlier. It's an awesome process goal. Um, if you can't eat 300 calories an hour on the bike, that's totally understandable, especially if you're not somebody who's been used to fueling yourself, you know, really liberally and well during your training, start somewhere. So start with hundred calories an hour and get to a point where that feels doable from a behavioral standpoint, because this is building a new habit. So it's just that the behavioral part of this is remembering to eat, remembering to pack the food with you, actually eating on the bike, at, you know, good time intervals. Um, and then there's also the physiological adaptation, which is just training your gut to be able to process this stuff. And so if you're hydrating well, you know, get to a point where you're comfortable and you feel a good, you built a good habit of eating hundred calories an hour and then bump it up to 200 and then bump it up to 300, but it takes time. So be patient with yourself, but this is an awesome, awesome goal to set for yourself. Because again, it's one of those that's fully within your control and it will make your training feel so much better. Yeah. hundred percent. Be a world yeah. tour eater, not just a peddler. <laughs>